Welcome back to another episode of Home But Not Alone. And today we got one of my favorite artists of all time. He is a Canadian country singer who's been who's born and raised in Regina, Saskatchewan. You might have heard his angelic voice on the radio as he currently has five top ten on his resume with oh, wow. singles like Red Dress, <laughs> Something to Wrap My Heart Around, A Better On You. But he's not only just a great singer, he's an amazing guy. He's a big advocate in the mental health community, a volunteer at the Ronald McDonald House in BC, but he's also a stand-up and selfless guy as he takes his time to support his to support and check in on his friends and family. My guy, he is a hockey loving, moonshine swinging, NHL 20 killer, Jojo Mason. Oh, let's go. <laughs> what up, boy? <laughs> oh, good, man. It's nice to see you, bro. It's nice to see you. Nice to see you too, man. I, like I said, I appreciate you doing this a lot, man. Of course. So um, tell me, how, like, how are you? How's your family, like, with all the COVID things happening? You know what, man? It's it's uh, it's good. It, it is what it is. We need to be adapting as we go. And, you know, the initial shock of it is kind of over. Right. I think right. everybody kind of went through it and 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 was oh, how are we going to pay the bills? How are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? How are we going to we can't live and everybody's all getting going all crazy. I was one of them trying to figure I told I was on tour when the whole thing happened. Right. Um, and I'm on the phone with 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 my fiance. I'm saying, hey. I don't know why everybody's going to get some toilet paper, but go get some dang toilet paper. I don't have some crap dinner. Stock up just in case. <laughs> Who knows? But it was one of those. We we doing good, man. Now the initial shock of it's over. We're we've adapted and 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 we you know we're just trying to trying to stay up. Right. So it's kind of like the things you could probably do in the past. Like I know you would like to go to like a fitness gym. Um, you would probably go on walks with your dog and things like that. What have you been doing to replace those things? Like any Ooh. personal development things you've been doing? I see Man, a guitar in the back. Yeah, it's don't don't get it twisted. That thing stays there. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's you know what I mean. We've been we've been like I said, we've been adapting. And and one thing I've I've been doing is is these mental health Mondays, which um, for me has been really helping keep me uh, keeping me holding myself accountable. To, to setting little goals, right? And I feel like if I'm setting these goals every every week, trying to trying to bang them out every week, I feel like I'm still accomplishing something. So I'm just feeling like I'm still relevant. So what I what I've been doing, I've been I've been making sure I work out every day, whether it be five minutes, even just you know doing a couple of push ups or or you know going around the pond in my out in my backyard, you know doing something. I got to be doing something because. I'll go, I'll go crazy if I can't be, you know, moving, if I can't be active, if I can't be, you know, I, I play a lot of hockey too, but I can't play anymore. So what do I do? I went and got some rollerblades and I'll be rollerblading all over the place. Right. And awesome. Little, little things like that. Just trying again, like we said, we adapted. Mm, that's, that's awesome. And um, have you picked up any old hobbies ever since that happened? Like I know, like, I used to skateboard a lot growing up. Yeah. Like it was, <laughs> skateboarding was my first love. And, um, now that like I can't go play tennis, which is something I picked up, can't go play basketball. I'm like, well, I might as well buy a skateboard. Have you have you done anything new? I, well, we okay. we got the we got the roller blades going. We we play we I there's a, a a school that's nearby my house that's caged off and and uh, but it's got the cage uh, uh, hockey net. So that's one thing I've been I've been really trying to do my best on. And and uh, when I was younger, I used to I used to box a little bit too, right and. And so I've been, I've been trying to, you know, again, my workouts, I've been, uh, I've been trying to shadow box a little bit, you know, I've been trying to, <laughs> you know, trying to keep my, get my hands back and, uh, and little things like that, man. Hobbies. I, I'm a video game guy. I've been a video game guy my, my whole life. So the normal things haven't really changed in that regard. Like I still, I play with my buddies every, every, every other night and, and it's good. So we, like I said, man, we adapted, we trying to, we just trying to, trying to stay focused to know that there is an end to this, right? Mm -hmm. Getting these, getting these old habits, keeping them fresh, man. So, so like you were saying a little bit ago that you were on tour um, with Gord Benford, correct? And, um, sure. but now that's obviously postponed or canceled. So what have you been doing for um, per professional development? Like I seen that on your story, you were recording a song yesterday. Yeah, we was, yeah, we was on, man. And it's nice the, that. Is it, was that in your house? 
No, that was in in my my producer's house. So we okay. went over to his crib, and and he set it up where it's like a, a, a separate entrance to get into the studio and to get into Love the it. booth, and like he's got it all blocked off and quarantined proper and and whatnot. And it's 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 good. So one thing I realized, you know, again, we was on tour. It was awful that we had to shut it all down, and and I felt bad for the fans and for you know. Uh, for myself and my fellow artists, my musicians, the actual band that was playing, like it, it's, it's tough. But one thing we can control is, is our interactions with people. So I've been doing a lot of interviews, man. And, and, uh, and one thing I can control is the music that we put out. So as soon as we got back, man, we started trying to, okay, these are the songs we want to record. Let's get into the booth. Let's lay them down. And, and, and now it's given us an opportunity to really dial in, uh, you know what the next project is gonna be, and we got uh, we got some good, we got some new yeah. new coming, bro. I'm coming to that um, party. If it's in the out west, I'm flying. Hey, that's it. I'm coming to, it. <laughs> to that uh, release party for sure. Yes, sir, yes, sir. So I do know that you said, uh, and you claim you're not a great writer, a natural writer, which I doubt because you've <laughs> had some amazing thoughts on some great songs in your um, EPs in the past. So have you been trying to write a little bit, like trying to hone that craft? One thing I've been doing, man, is just writing, trying to write poetry more than anything. I know, I know where I'm at. And that's a hard mm-hmm. thing. That was a hard thing for me to kind of get over in, in, the, in the initial stages of my career was like, I can't, I'm not, I'm not that good of a writer. <laughs> what? Me? Really? <laughs> Dang, that sucks. Here's what I've learned. Here's what I've learned is like, I'm, I'm just going to keep practicing and practicing and practicing. But if I have a message that I want to say and somebody else who's been writing songs for, you know, 15, 20 years, if they can say the exact same thing that I want to say better and more clever than me, just because of experience, mm-hmm. um, why, why not let them say it? It's still the same message that I want to portray. It's still the yeah. same, you know, the same vision that I have or what I want. And, and so to, to know where I'm at as a writer, is 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 such a blessing but it's also like i wish i was a little bit better so what i've been doing man i've been i've been focusing i've been trying to write poetry almost every other day and and whether it be you know a couple lines in a in a in a rhyme or something like that and, and it could be anything right, right. And different topics about like a coffee cup if you want for example right? you need to write about how you want to go get your coffee and it could be a, a simple little like you know three line four line five line little poem and and mm-hmm. and why not, right? Because essentially that's what writing music is. It's poetry, baby. It really is. Like one of my favorite TV shows. <laughs> not don't want to be cliche, but it is Nashville. I I, I watched Nashville before becoming yeah. a big fan of country music. But uh, in the beginning of the show, they were saying uh, writing is, I mean, music is poetry with a melody. And growing up in high school, I was voted most likely to be a famous writer and most like, and I went to prep school and I was like, most likely to be a famous author. And I was Hold like, on. and I was like, is it following me? So I've always had like this ability to write. Right. But I've never had the courage to be like, all right, like, let me make this into some songs. So I have, like, I've written poems slash songs, but yeah. uh, what, like when you write music, when you're in the writing music process, when, when are you like, all right, this is worthy of somebody's, ear or are you always like anything should is worth you somebody's ears you know what man you when what i've learned is is co-writing is is a is a real help to gain confidence right you get into a room with some of these guys i've been down to nashville a couple of times and and jumped in a room with some very experienced writers a lot more experienced than me so when you go in it's kind of intimidating right these guys have written big hits for people and and you walk in and one thing that they preach is there's no bad ideas, but you can't get married to any idea. So when they, you know, these guys are, are, are always like anything you got, man, spit it out, spit it out, spit it out, spit it out. Let's go. If any idea is a good idea, if you have a melody, any melody is a good idea. Let's, let's get it all down and something's going to click. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to, when it comes to the confidence about putting stuff out, you just can't be married to it and you can't be scared to, to have, you know, part of my language. You can't be scared to have shitty ideas. <laughs> right, know? right. So if you're going to put yourself out there, man, you might as well go full tilt. Cause if you're going to put 10 things out, maybe one's going to hit. Right. That's very good. That's you very can't. good advice. Yeah. So talking about your, um, going down to Nashville, a core, right. Right. Um, you wrote good kind of love in yeah. Nashville with Dan and, uh, 
His name was Phil. My man, my man, Phil Barton. Philly Phil B. Barton, there you go. Um, was that your first experience of writing in Nashville? Was it your first time? Yeah. Huh? It was? Can yeah, that was my, that was my first time going to. Dude, it was, a, it was <laughs> magic, was crazy. Man. Have you been? <laughs> I've been I've been uh, in September, man. I've been tired. It's, it's wild, man. It's wild. It's, uh, it, was, it was such a such a cool experience for me, especially having never been down and never ha- not having any real experience uh, getting in a room with some of these guys. And, and at the time, Dan was, a, you know, he's still a, a great writer, but, um, you know, to be in the presence of somebody like Phil, who's an absolute gem of a human, but he's also, he's one of those guys that like, hey man, any idea? Let's go. What you got? Let's go. Throw it out. Let's go. Let's go. He's so encouraging. Mm-hmm. So to be in a room, be in a room with, with, with him, was was just magic man i felt so calm and confident like no matter what the trash i was you know and i was brand new this was five years ago right so i was, right, I was right. had all my ideas down on my on my paper on my phone and and, and I'm, I'm telling these guys these my ideas i got a title good kind of love what y'all think as it, it could go like you know and i started just spewing a little bit you know some ideas and and it allowed them to kind of like okay we're gonna take this and and your ideas and, and the, the lines that you have to contribute, we're going to take them. We're going to expand on it. So mm-hmm. we did just that, man. It was such a, an amazing process to, to, to be a part of. I still have all my pictures and videos from my very first writing session. And, and it was crazy, man. It was absolute magic. It, it's, it's, it's addicting too, right? Right, right. You want to get, I want to get back, man. If I could be down there all the time. <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. I, I think man, the same that, thing. I told everybody I'm going to retire at 35, and at 35, I'm becoming a country artist. So I'm just <laughs> packing up the, the skeletons of all the songs, and then when I go down there, it's just going to be filling <laughs> meat and bones. That's all it's going to be. That's it. I love it. <laughs> man, so in 2013, December 23rd, to be Woo! exact, all right, to be very exact, all right. <laughs> For those who don't know, you give credit to a mason jar uh, of Moonshine for facilitating an introduction with your manager, Dan Swinimer, right? Yeah. As the night went on, you were asked if you could sing, and you say, I'm not the worst. <laughs> I sing in the shower, right? Yeah. So what was it about your, your shower performances that gave you the confidence to do a follow-up? Bro, there was zero confidence at that time. I was, I, man, I was not the, a good version of myself. But I knew at the time, and I'll never forget this, I remember sitting at a friend's house and, and it was late at night and I was, you know, again, not a great version of myself. And I, I remember sitting there thinking to myself, like, there's gotta be something more than this. I was a bartender at the time. So it was just like the same repetitive over and over and over. I knew there had to be something better. So it was such a, to, to be able to, to, you know, walk into this situation, not having any expectations as to, you know, what was going on. I, I didn't even know that there was going to be a music producer uh, even at this, at this party. Right. So I walked into the party, I put this jar of moonshine down on the table and, and, and it, it must have been fate because this dude rolls up on me and he was like, Hey, I was writing a song earlier in a day, in, in the day, me and this co-writer were arguing about a line in a song, sipping moonshine out of a jar. This idiot doesn't believe people drink things out of a jar. And here you are with the damn jar. Can we take a picture? Send it to this guy. So it, 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 it's just all started to unfold from there. We became buds. And he says to me, man, it's too bad you're not a singer. And I can guarantee you, <laughs> if it hadn't have been for the copious amounts of moonshine I had been drinking that night, I would not have said, I could try. <laughs> you know? right. Right. It was just one of those, hey, what you got to lose? Now, the crazy I'm part, bro, sure. was the crazy part was waking up the next day and, and like going through my pockets, I'm like, oh shoot, okay. So I grabbed this card out of my pocket, and and it was it was uh, Dan's number, mm-hmm. and so I messaged him, and I sat there before I messaged him. I sat there with this <laughs> card in my hand, and I'm sitting there like, what the hell am I thinking right now? There's no there's no way I could possibly do something this crazy, man. This is this is insane. Why would I put myself in this? So I'm talking myself out of it, and then I was like, hey. what do you have to lose? what you got to lose. Right. And I did say, I did say earlier in that year too, that that year was going to be my year of yes. I told my mama this, we had this conversation. I have been so wrapped up in in the past, not saying yes and accepting opportunities and, you know, just going around, just going by day to day. I just said, you know, 
fuck it. Yeah, let's go. Let's, let's do it. You know what I mean? Try, mm-hmm. let's try it out. So I messaged him and then it all just unfolded. I man, I was smoking two packs of cigarettes a day too. <laughs> like I remember I, I messaged him. He said, okay, go to this site, pick any song you want to. And, uh, and, and load it up to this karaoke, from this karaoke, load it up to the USB, bring it over, and we'll, we'll see what you got. I remember sitting, I remember sitting in my car, bro. I was like, like <laughs> just like in panic. I was sitting right outside of this house, just like chain smoking, cigarette after cigarette after cigarette. And eventually I was like, all right, let's go. Let's try it out. And I picked Chicken Fried by Zach um, Brown Band, right? Chicken Fried. And I was going to ask, what made you choose Chicken Fried? <laughs> I love the song. I knew the song. I knew it front to back. I loved mm. it. I felt good singing it in the car, in the shower. And <laughs> and, and it was one of my favorite songs at the time. And, right. That's and, an amazing uh, song. Right. It's a good song. So I said, why not? It's um, We'll see how it goes, right? So I walked into this time. I walked in and I said, hey, how's it going? A friend of mine was waiting there for me too. I said, hey, how's it going? Yeah, yeah. We, sh- we shot the breeze a little bit and then, all right, get your butt in the booth. Put the headphones on, I man. And when I got those cans on, all of a sudden I'm, sp- I'm singing it. To- I- I'm talking into this microphone and I'm-, I'm thinking to myself, like, this is a mistake. Like, what am I thinking, man? What am I thinking? This is insane. And it just kind of... You know, I, 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 the, the music started to play and I remember, okay, and I started singing and this, the way that he tells it is, is like, as soon as I opened my mouth, he was doing cartwheels in the, you know, in the, in his, in his control room and he was doing his thing. He was just going nuts. Like what? The, this is insane. Right. And you got to remember too, Jay is like, I wasn't, I'm not, I, I wasn't a singer, right? Like I, I had no intentions of being a singer. I had no intentions of music being in my, in my life other than being a fan of music. So to have that opportunity kind of come was surreal, man. Right. Surreal. Right. That's awesome. Good. It was I good, love, man. I love that story. It's so <laughs> unorthodox from all the other stories you really hear. So for you to come yeah. up and find success in this is literally amazing. Like, a lot of people don't know, and I talk about it in past interviews, is I had a very thin, a short stint in modeling and acting, and it was for the same for the same reasons as you were. My friends was kept pro. pro I used to go to school in Iowa and play basketball, and uh, one of my best friends was like, "This guy's a model. This guy's a model. Have you seen his abs?" And it just it was a snowball effect. So when I came back home for the summer, I got an agent, and he was like, and I just I was like, I'll try acting. I mean, I'll try modeling. And then he's like, you know what? You have interviews for, to do a TV show. Go now. And, that, and you're there in this room and you have no idea what you're doing. Oh. And you're like, all right, let's do it. What do I have to lose? <laughs> what you got to lose, right? <laughs> and next thing you know, you book TV shows and movies and things like that. And it just creates, right? So it's, I love to hear the fact that <laughs> you took a leap of faith and it worked out. So I love it. You know what, man? You got, that's what life is, man. That's what life is. If, if you're not putting yourself out there and putting yourself in uncomfortable positions that could potentially work out or saying no to opportunities that mm-hmm. come your way out of, out of sheer fear or the fact that you feel like you don't deserve it or something like that. And then you, then that opportunity is, has been wasted. Right. So, I mean, Hey, my, my advice, if I were, if I were to give me some advice back, old Jojo back, some of you oh, man, advice, jump into my questions, man. That's my oh, shoot, okay, 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 okay. I'll, <laughs> You go, you go, you go, you do it. <laughs> no, I'm excited that you're already going there. But I have one more thing to talk about your personal yeah. life real quick. Um, so do you come from a music, like a musically inclined family? I know your mother came on stage with you and played the piano. Like, <laughs> yeah. how did that work out? Oh, man, that was such a special time for me. When I was younger, my mom played the piano. Mama Joan, she was, she was great. Um, but she stopped playing a long time ago, right? Um, so when this, you know, she'd been through a lot, she'd been through a lot of real hard times in the last, you know, five years. So I, I, I saw an opportunity, you know, she played in university, she played all through, you know, high school. And, and, and so I saw an opportunity. I was like, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rent your piano for Christmas. If you, if you love to play again, if you feel good about it, then keep playing and, and I'll, you know, we'll end up buying it out. I'll buy it out for you. And you can just keep playing and playing and playing. And I had a show coming up and I was like, okay, mama Joan, if you want to, how would you feel about coming on stage with me? And, uh, and she immediately shut it down. 
um, the confidence wasn't there, right? Mm-hmm. She hasn't played in 20 years, something like that. And, and so when, when I finally, you know, I kept, I kept planting the seed and planting the seed. Hey, have you thought about it yet? Hey, have you thought about it every day? Are you practice, mom, why don't you just practice this song? And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, no big deal. So it was really cool that finally I, I you know, I convinced her and I was able to give her an opportunity to, to really feel what I feel on that stage when right. thousands of people are, are, are singing back. That's, for me, there's no better feeling. And I knew that my mama deserved that. So I wanted to get her up and, and play. But man, other than my mom playing the piano when she was a kid, my family isn't musical at all. Like at all. It's hilarious. I don't know what happened or or what I was if I was just blessed or something, but right. I, I I'm just I'm just glad I don't suck, man. <laughs> hey, but you, you made a song that said made for you. So That's hey, it. you technically you were made for it, so I love it. But talking about made for you, right? Um Growing up, you you grew up in Regina, Saskatchewan. I don't know many people from Saskatchewan, <laughs> um, and you grew up playing hockey, right? And now you're in a co- industry where it is mainly dominated by uh, Caucasian people, right? So, yeah. um, playing hockey in a predominantly white community, right, <clears throat> or sport, did that did that give you like that thick skin or that confidence that you can be like, all right, let me enter this industry and as a black male? You know what, man? It was, it's so funny. Cause I, I, I love talking about talking about race stuff when it comes to, to country music or, or sports and stuff. But for me, man, I, I just, when I was in Regina, I moved when I was about 14. So mm-hmm. I feel like I was young enough to not like, obviously I knew, I, I know that I'm black and I know the history behind it. And I know that, you know, you know, the, I know the, the stereotypes when I'm that age and it, it's, it just really never affected me. Right. Um, I've had the, you know, and I'm sure you've had it too, where there's the most crude things have been said to you. You end up building that thick skin and, right. and, and, you know, you realize that people can't hurt you. Right. People can't hurt you with those kinds of words anymore. Well, for me anyways, I'm, I'm not sure how, we, how you deal, bro. But you know, it's like for you. me, I've, I've heard it all, man. I've heard it all. There's not much you can say to me now when it comes to my skin color that, you know, that will offend me. That, mm-hmm. That's how you feel. That's how you feel. That's what it is. But coming from, from a predominantly white uh, uh, atmosphere, I guess, um, it just, it, it didn't really affect me, man. I, I love music. I love good music. And that's all, that's all it is to me. Right. It doesn't right. matter if you're black, if you're Asian, if you're white, if you're, you know, Filipino, it, 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 none of it really mm-hmm. matters if the music is good. Mm-hmm. Right. So for me coming in, making the jump from, from, you know, hockey all the way to, uh, to, to, to country music, you know, uh, country music, people look at me and they're like, no, man, man, even, even in the early stages of my career, uh, people that, Hey, what do you, what do you do for, you know, what, what do you want to do? I said, well, I sing, I sing, I'm in music. I do music. And they're like, Oh, what kind of music? Uh, rap music, uh, hip hop music, you know, this and that. And I'm just like, no, country music. And they're like, no, you're not. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're not. And so that's the reaction. I kind of like that reaction because when they right. end up hearing my stuff, they know that it, it, you know, it's not the worst. Right. So, so to, to, uh, to answer your question, man, coming from uh, being, being black in a predominantly white uh, culture, I guess, it doesn't really affect me, man. Honestly, everybody is just all about love, all about embracing each other. And that's one thing I love about country music is that we all support each other. We all that's, love each other, man. Mm-hmm. That's something I did learn like very early on. <clears throat> Long story short, I used to hate country music. And it comes from a guy who I grew up skateboarding. So obviously I started wearing skinny jeans before skinny jeans were a thing. So when you talk about the hate, man, I heard it all. And I grew up in the hood, so it's like people always see me skate my skateboard. They're like, Junior, what are you doing? I'm like, don't yeah. worry about me, all right? Yeah, so, I'm all right. <laughs> I'm like, I don't worry. Like, I'm all right. I'll, yeah. Like, I know people would follow, but like, so I grew up listening to hip-hop, rock, everything but country. Moved to Iowa. My roommate is from Alabama. Oh. Bumping Florida Georgia line, bumping Sam Hunt. And, I'm, and we would get into fights. I would hate it, right? I could never imagine myself actually listen to it. And then I was introduced to Darius Rucker, and I was like, this, all right, this ain't bad. And then I went from Darius Rucker the same month, getting a guitar, going to a Kenny sure. Chesney concert, and that hey. day life, right? So I was afraid when I nice. went to the concert. I was like, 
I man, I'm going to stick out as a sore thumb. I'm telling my best yeah. friend this. He's like, Dude, like, don't worry the country. Nobody, everybody's there for music, right? I'm like, all right, you're right. I go. I'm the only black person there. You can see it. But yeah. everybody was about love and support and yeah. had probably one of the best times of my life. And that just made me even feel more welcome into the music industry. And that's for those who are listening and watching this, like, should I be scared of listening to country music? No, nah, everybody who listens to it is welcoming and appreciative and loving. So that's it, man. Let's talk about um a little bit about your music career where you meet hey. Dan in 2014, well, you signed with uh, Manic Down Production in 2014, mm -hmm. and you later on signed with 604 Records in 2016. That's is right. That, so can you talk to us about what happens in those two years? It's kind of like The Lion King, where you see <laughs> Simba walking across the forest, totally. and he just growing up. Like, tell us what happens between those two years. Oh, man, what a, what a process it's been. It's It's been a lot of, a lot of really good things that have happened, but a lot of, you know, a lot of struggle as well. This industry is as much as, again, as much as we love each other and support each other, it's very, very cutthroat as well. And it's very, very hard for somebody like myself who, who who's never had any experience deal with, you know, some of the things that were thrown my way, just on a whim, reacting, seeing how that kind of plays out. But those two years, man, when I first started, it was a, the first year was a, a real big learning curve. We hadn't, re we didn't release anything till 2015. So when I met Dan, it was, it was like, okay, this is what we're going to do. These are the things I need to be working on. These are things I need to do. And there was a lot of, a lot of times where, you know, I questioned whether it was my, whether I should be doing this. And I'm sure he questioned whether we should be doing this. And, mm -hmm. and we both just kind of said, okay, let's, you know, let's, let's, let's power through and see how it goes. And, and uh, unfortunately, him and I are not, you know, we went our separate ways amicably, of course, and, mm -hmm. um, and, and we're not working together anymore. But when it, you get to a certain point, um, you, you, the team needs to expand and, and, and the demand becomes higher. So that's exactly what we did. We, we, uh, we had a couple different um, labels knocking on the door and, and, and we decided, you know, stick with 604. It, it's, it's A, it's local. Um, B, they've had some incredible success. Uh, right. With some of, with a lot of their artists would be you know Dow Smith default with with, right. with actually him and default but theory of a dead man Mariana's trench like the list Carly Rae Jepsen like the list goes yeah. on and on and on so not only are they were they an independent um, a major independent label um, but it was just cool they they let us they let me continue to have creative control I got to pick the songs I got you know it was it was such a good situation at the time so once we switched over to the team with 604 man it like it was like okay it's game on now now mm -hmm. we now we go it was exciting but like i said then there's been a lot of ups and a lot of downs so the, the growth in in and the things that i've learned about this business have been have been i wouldn't trade for anything mm -hmm. i absolutely wouldn't trade for for anything but Again, it's been a lot of ups and a lot of downs. So it's been a crazy, it's been a crazy ride, man. So far in those two years was was this, was like the the learning blocks of of where I'm at now, and and you know to build that thick skin in this business. I love it, love it, man. So talking about like thick skin in the business, right? And measuring success, <clears throat> songs like Red Dress, Future, Better on You, um, are some of your, some of your songs that surpass millions of streams on uh, music platforms, right? But for yourself, do you measure success as on a, uh, based on the streams that it receives or based on um, you actually singing the song and like feeling good about it and the message you're portraying? I think that's the biggest thing, man. At first, at first I was so oblivious to absolutely everything. I wasn't paying attention to streams. I wasn't paying attention to, you know, the demand. I wasn't paying attention to the radio plays. It wasn't, it wasn't about that for me at the beginning. And it's still, you know, uh, we went through a period of time where it was like, okay, the last thing you want to do is go backwards, right? So we had right. bang, 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 one, two, three, four top tens in a row. And then the next one was a top 15. And then the next one was only a top 20. And it was like, okay, wait, what's, what's, and then you start to get in your head and you start to pay attention to the, you know, the, all of the streams and all of the, the, the things. Once you get past the fact that like, there's no formula for it. There really is. If there was a formula to, for success in music, millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of people would be like here. Right. right. Um, but for me, it was, it was a, a process to, to really learn, like to go from 
zero expectations to, you know, on my phone, like, okay, I need to look at the streams. I need to know what's going on every second, every week, every day. I need to know. I just love that I'm in a position, excuse me, I love that I'm in a position where I just get to put out music that I love, man. And, and for me, that's my measure of success. I, I, if, if the music is good and I love the music and, and the gigs come and the shows come and everything comes from it, cool. If it doesn't, bro, I still, I'm in a position where I get to put out music, man. I never bro. thought I'd be, I never thought I'd be doing something like that. I got a team that believes in me. I got a team that, that, that is fighting for me tooth and nail. I love to focus on, on just the creative stuff and the music and the stuff that I get to, the things that I have control over. That was a big thing for me is, is realizing the things that I have control over and the things that I don't. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, it's easy to, to get wrapped up in all the things like, why, you know, what's happening over there with that person? What's happening over there? Why is that person getting 5 million streams and I'm only getting 2 million streams? You know, right, it's, right. it's easy to get in your head. But the fact that the fact of the matter is, bro, music is universal music is love music is and that's all it is for me now i I just love that i get to create i get to uh, put that put myself out there man it's it's such a it's such a relief it's such a blessing so there really isn't a i need to how many streams i got it's not it's not about that you know it's not about it's about love and music and putting and being able to show who i am Mm -hmm. to to the people that want to listen that's that's really important that you say that because uh, one thing that I try to preach on my platform is um, measuring success by someone's character, by your character and your intentions and uh, hearing you uh, just solidify, hit it to the point where it's like, if it makes, if it makes you happy, things that you love, songs that you love to you, that's success. Cause people are hearing that you're making feel people, people feel good. That's a big win. I'm happy yeah. that you're happy that you're talking about it. So appreciate that a lot. Of course, man. Uh, another thing I want to talk about is in one of my favorite movies. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called Almost Famous. Have you seen that? Uh, Drew Barrymore. Yes. Okay. Almost Famous is one of my favorite movies, okay. and okay. the main character says, "The main character, William Miller, says, do you have to be depressed to write a sad song? Do you have to be in love to write a love song? Is the song better when it really happens to you? Do you agree with this quote? Because, and I ask you this question because okay. you're known to be a hopeless romantic, and you yeah. perform songs that reflect that." So do you feel like when you get a song you, you read it and you're like, man, this is me, that, that you can actually perform it or you, you can embody it better or you can relate to it more? I, what, I, what I always say, man, is I'll never put out a song that doesn't, that doesn't make me feel something, mm-hmm. right? And that, for me, that's the biggest thing is, is uh, man, hmm. <laughs> it's a good, that's a good, it's a good quote, but I, I don't know if really, if, I mean, Hey, if, if, if I'm feeling something like when I did that cover of numb, right. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not that at the time I was depressed or at the time I was sad or at the time I was, you know, or when I sing that song, I'm not always sad or depressed. And I don't feel like I can sing it better if I'm going through it. Mm-hmm. But I do know that it has been a part of me and the music that I do, I do touch on and I, I sing and that I, I put out, I do really, really feel like it comes from a place of, of, of myself and who I am and, 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 and what I want to portray to the world and what I want to share, right? Obviously, there's, there's sides of me that, you know, are, are personal and I, I'm very much an open book for the most part, right? Mm-hmm. So when I'm, when I'm putting out music, when I'm singing songs, I just try my best to, to, to make sure that I connect with it. Cause I know that if I'm connecting with it, some, uh, there's got to be somebody else that's going to connect with it as well. Right. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't really sing better when I, when I'm going through it or if I'm just having it, but you know, it all, it all depends. Right. I think the word to that is connect because um, I think the, that quote would have been accurate if it said, uh, is a song better if it if you can connect to it or like something like that because one of my favorite songs of all time uh i can't stop playing it my guitar is still <laughs> half, half a tune down half a step down because because i play it so much is you and tequila by kenny chesty and oh, wow. uh, okay the song came out in like 2001 right yeah by a girl named dina carter i believe and she he first heard it when he was on tour with with dino but the song talks about being in Malibu in California and this and that. And he did not feel like he could relate to the song until you moved to Malibu. And then he's like, man, this song makes sense. So he cuts it and it becomes a, a number yeah. one top hit song. Right. So I think the word is really connect to, to make that quote even better. 
which is something I love. All right, so let's talk about mental health a little bit. Oh, um, I'm ready. <laughs> so before we even talk about Mental Health Mondays and where you're at right now, I want to take it all the way back to when you were playing sports hockey and you um, ended up having a career-ending injury. I want to know, like, how at such a young age, because you were around 14, 15, how old were you at that time? I was, when I, I, when I got hurt, I was about was it 16 or si- 17, I was about 17 or 18, I think, is, is when, when the injury really, you know, really got up. me. Can you talk to us about, like, how you cope with it and what gave you hope and just talk to us through that process of recovery? Because Bro, I, I personally like had an a injury that halted my, one of my seasons of my, with my ACL, and I know I had to learn how to bring myself back up, and it was kind of a routine of, I didn't learn, man. I was a, I was a, oh, it was bad. I was, got to the point too, because I was working, I was working, you know, two jobs. I was bartending at, at nights and I was a garbage man during the day. So like, I was always, I was lifting things. I was lifting kegs. I was lifting trash bags. Like I was always out. I was active. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then, uh, you know, on the weekends and, and we'd have practice every other day, I, I'd go to, you know, I'd go to work, go to practice, go to, go to play and play games. And, to, to know that this is what you're supposed to be doing. You got the, you got money rolling in, you're working hard, you're hustling, you're doing, you're feeling good. You got, got your boys with you. You got your girls with you and everything's great. It, it, to have all of it just kind of go away. Mm-hmm. I didn't cope well. I, man, I, and I mean, I, I don't know how much I should be preaching about this, but I was, I was smoking crazy amounts of dope. I was smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. I was drinking bottles of bottles and bottles and bottles by myself. The minute I would wake up, I was just trying to numb the pain. I would go to the doctor. The doctor would give me bullshit. Part of my language would give me mm-hmm. some BS exercises to do. I would do them. I'd go back and nothing was working. Well, I got to a point where my, I was living with my brother at the time. My parents had relocated to the mainland in Vancouver. And, and uh, my brother called my mom, mm-hmm. told on me, like, a, ah, man. <laughs> but I was, I was mad. But what really, what really got me and really the thing that really flipped that switch in my brain um, that, like, oh, my God, I'm not okay. Uh, was when I yelled at my mom and I got to remember my mom was my best friend. She, you know, I talked to her every day on the phone and, and, and it was, she, she asked, she called me out. It was her calling me out on my, on my BS. Right. Mm -hmm. Jojo, I don't think you should be doing this. I know what, I know you're at home doing it. In my mind, I was like, excuse you. Who do you think you are? What? And I snapped. I, man, I, and we was in the car. We, I, I'll never forget this day. We was at the ferry terminal driving from uh, mainland to island. And, and I, I yelled at her, bro. And I've never spoken to anybody like that, mm-hmm. let alone my best friend. Right. And that was the moment it kind of just clicked. It was like, oh, my God, I, I'm in trouble. I don't know how to deal with this. And my, all, my whole mental game was my whole mental game was just if I can't deal with it myself, what kind of man am I? What kind of person am I? If I can't get, I don't need help. And if I can't figure it out myself, I don't deserve help. That was my mental, that was my mentality for, for the, the year and a half that I was, you know, in my rock bottom. And, and eventually, you know, I'll never forget the day. It was almost like, feels like a movie. You know what I mean? It feels like a movie. It was almost like my mom comes in and boom, kicks the door down and like grabs me by the ear. Let's, throws my ass in the car and says we're going home and so we ended up moving to I ended up moving from Victoria to uh to Vancouver and and dude it was like I I felt like I I was like detoxing I my dad said okay here's the rules he brought me to the house said these are the rules no sit no smoking no drinking no nothing you're going to be clean if you want to live in this house we'll take care of all the food we'll take care of all this we'll pay for your rehab we'll help you we will put you in a position, but I swear to God, do not, do not make me regret this. And I said, dad, I promise I won't let you down. Mom, I promise I won't let you down. And bro, it was months and months of months of just like, it was hell, bro. I'm not, it got to the point I couldn't walk by myself. Like I had, with, I couldn't stand on my feet for more than 20 minutes at a time. We ended up going to the, to, to, oh, to rehab for, for my, for the pain in my back. Right. And, 
And uh, I, I didn't sleep for about three days when I, when I first got there because the pain was so excruciating. And uh, I felt like I was detoxing. I, I, I was drinking a bottle a day, you know, crazy amounts of, you know, crazy amounts of dope and, and, mm. and, and cigarettes, no cigarettes, no nothing. It was like cold turkey done. I was, I couldn't stop sweating. And I'm, I don't think I've ever been this open and honest about this, but um, it was a tough, it was a tough time. So that, that moment that really clicked in my head was, was when I, I was mean to my best friend and my mom and, and she didn't deserve it. She was just looking out for me. And, and that's when it kind of clicked. I kind of just put my hands up to big guns upstairs and said, all right, it's in your hands. Let's go. I'm, I'm with you. Whatever the process is, let's, let's do it. And, and so to, to what I learned about myself was, was what I learned about myself was that I, I, when you get to your rock bottom, there's, it's, you, you don't need to go through it alone. You don't need to, you don't need to deal with that by yourself. And, mm-hmm. and, and the biggest thing I learned was being able to, you know, grab a hand that's been extended to you to, you know, to help. And, and for me, that's what I like to preach, man. My mental health game is, is up and it's down and it's up and it's down. I've seen counselors, I've seen, you know, therapists, I've, I've been up and I've been down and it's still to this day, it's up and down. However, now I feel like I'm in a position where because of, you know, the things that I've been through, I know when, I know when I'm starting to go down and I know the things that I do to flip that switch back. So my mental game stays up instead of letting myself go back down right go back down it's i love that you say that um one of my one of my challenges last week was to feel as many emotions as you possibly can in a day right right? and i'm i work full time and i do this as well and i haven't got the chance to release my blog but the reason behind me saying feel all the emotions you can is because all right if i can intentionally make myself sad by watching a sad video I will, I know what that, I'm conscious of that feeling and I'm conscious of what I do after watching a sad video is call somebody, hang out with somebody, watch a funny video. So it's being able to have go through those emotions and recognizing them is so important, right? So whether you're talking to somebody or you have self-care methods and I'm so glad that you said that. So that's awesome. I'm really happy that you shared on my, (laughs) on my channel, on my platform. (laughs) I'm with you, bro. I told you I'm with you, man. All right, my last question when it comes to mental health, um, it, let's talk about the music career and being a country singer in a cutthroat industry. Um, being a musician in itself is already a vulnerable career as you are performing in front of everybody. How do you cope now that you are a musician and on stage and your life is a little less private? I ask, I ask questions. I ask questions, I ask questions, I ask questions, man. And that was the biggest thing that I learned when I was, you know, I was, I was going to see my therapist and stuff is, is, you know, if you don't know something, ask, or if you're feeling a certain way, somebody else is guaranteed to have either felt a similar feeling as you or, or, or figure, you know, ask questions. So what I've done and I've, I've done, I feel like I've done a really good job is, is, is creating, um, not really creating, but joining in to, the the uh, the vices that are at my disposal when i say that i mean um the people that have been in the industry they know how to deal right they they still go through the ups and they still go through the downs but they've been there like so i like uh, mentors mentors man i ask the questions I, I you know guys like guys like aaron i've been fans of these guys too from even before i was in music I'm aaron Pritchett has been such a a, a solid rock for me. Dallas Smith has been a solid rock. Chad Brownlee. And these guys are always there for anybody. You reach mm-hmm. out, you say, Hey, I'm, I'm having a time, bro. Like this is how I'm feeling. I don't know why I'm feeling this way. And they're very, very good. Um, about, about being, being present and knowing, knowing how to deal. So uh, it's, it, it's such a good community, man. That's, that's how I deal now is if I'm starting to feel a certain way, Hey, dog I, i'm this is what's happening right. Whew, is this normal yes it's normal of course it's normal right don't worry it's don't awesome. stress yeah okay all right all right so i just i talk as much as i can and, and i ask as many questions as i can depending on how i'm feeling man. i love that and um one thing that i was told like a month ago was like man you do not lose 
nobody's ever been depressed by giving. And when somebody reaches out to you, it's actually like you're reaching out to them because yeah. you also get that satisfaction to see somebody help each other. So when the people are watching this, if you see somebody that needs to help, needs, has an opportunity to get mentored, bro, give, give a helping hand. And here's what I, here's what I will say too. It doesn't take much. That's mm -hmm. it. Doesn't take much. Two second text message. That's it. Right. That's it. Ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. That's my biggest, that's my biggest thing. Don't be afraid. Awesome. Don't be afraid to be vulnerable, man. That's it. All right. So I want to ask you something. Hit me. So two questions about advice and uh, tips and tricks. So somebody watching this could be me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> somebody watching this is aspiring to become an artist and a musician. Yeah. All right. What would be the, the advice that you would give them to excel in the industry? From never singing outside the bedroom to uh, being on tour. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and be true to who you are, you know, surround yourself with, with great people, of course. But I always, I always say this, man, is, is especially in country music, people will call you out on your bullshit. If you're trying to be a fake, whatever you should be trying to be fake, be who you are, put mm -hmm. out music that you love, because there's a very good chance that somebody, if you love it, somebody else going to love it too, man. Be true to who you are. No, grow into the person that you know you can be, and just don't be afraid to be vulnerable, man. That's my biggest thing. I had a buddy messaging me like, "Man, I'm starting to play guitar. I'm starting to play guitar. I'm starting to sing a little bit. I invested in an amp and a microphone, and you know, if you got any tips for me, I just said, them, don't be afraid to be vulnerable, man. It only takes one person to tell you that you don't suck." to boost that confidence, bro. I'm not playing. And that was, that's how it was with me. So every, every interview I was have, I would say, well, I just hope it doesn't suck. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love that's it. it man. Um, so my next one would be what you almost said last time. What advice would you give to a young Jojo? A young Jojo. Whew. Don't be afraid to say yes. Don't be afraid to say yes. Say yes more than saying no. Good things come from unknown. Good things come from the unknown. Bad things come, but also learning experiences. Don't be afraid to say yes to things, man. And don't be afraid to try hard to put yourself out there, man, and be vulnerable. That that would be my my advice to young Joe. Would be just don't be vulnerable. Be okay with being vulnerable, man. Put yourself out there. There's a good chance somebody might not hate it, right? Love it. So this kind of wraps up the interview. But before we go, I'd like to play a few quick games with my guests. Okay. All right. My okay. first game is called um, Explain the Post. All right. <laughs> so I show you a picture and you tell me what's the background story behind those pictures. All right. Okay. Ho! Oh, that was uh, me representing where I'm from in BC. Every, game, every time the riders come out to BC, me and my brother, my nephews, my boys, we all from Saskatchewan, we all go to the games. I love Watermelon it. helmets on point. <laughs> this picture, it's a little dark. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know what I call this? I call this Frojo. This Froby, like Kobe, this is the Frojo time of your life. <laughs> Man, that was, uh, that was uh, our vacation, our first, one of our first family vacations across the border. We went down to California. We was going to, we drove down in a, in a minivan all the way to, uh, uh, Univer Universal Studios, man. It was crazy. Crazy. <laughs> All right, this picture, next picture. <laughs> Pimpin' ain't easy, baby. <laughs> that was, <laughs> it, man, that was in social studies class. For some reason, there was a, a pink pimp hat on the table, and obviously it was sunny. So I was wearing my shades. I decided to put it on, and it wouldn't fit on my afro, so I put it on half my afro, and, <laughs> and I just rocked it for the whole class. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's something I do and still would do in the past, too. Our last picture, <laughs> this one. The boys. Oh, the boys, man. Those guys are, are incredible. I've, I've been on tour now with Gord twice and both times incredible. And Jimmy C in the middle, Jim Cressman, the guy's an absolute beauty. One of the greatest guys in the industry. Uh, and he's always been a really good advocate for me. So I really appreciate him. I really appreciate Gord as, a, as one of the homies. And, uh, and that's love, man. I recognize Gord. Who is the guy in the middle? Jim Cressman. If you look up Invictus uh, Entertainment Group, Whew. That's who he is. Check it out. He's the guy. 
big fan of Gore, so I I definitely recognize him. All right, so our last game, it's called Beat Shazam. So I'm going to play you some classic songs, and you just got to beat the machine, all right? So I just got to make sure this is going to work. All right, Jojo, man, it's been an absolute blast and a pleasure to get the opportunity to interview you. Been been a big fan for a long time. Just want to thank you one more time for coming on. All good, baby. All love, man. You know anything you need, Jay, you holler at me. You got my number now, too, so holler at me anytime, all right? Keep in touch. Let's do it. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. See you. Be good, man.